My name is Jeff Hunter uh, with VMware. I am a business continuity disaster recovery specialist, right? So I'm on the, the pre-sale side of the house. I'm a systems engineer for VMware, but I focus on things such as uh, you know, site recovery manager, VMware's HA capabilities, backup recovery. And of course, as this uh, particular session title indicates, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, availability of vCenter itself, right? Uh, it's become a pretty important part of the data center, I'm guessing, in, in most of your data centers. And uh, there's, there's certainly a need this day and age to keep uh, vCenter online. So we thought we'd go ahead and put a, a session together around that. Um, I've been with VMware about uh, four and a half years, but prior to that, I worked for a uh, rather large insurance company. So I've been in your shoes before. Uh, I understand some of the things that uh, you may come up against on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's, it's nice to have uh, both perspectives, if you will. Um, good news around this presentation, I, you know, I, I realize it's, uh, it's getting past the halfway mark here in the conference. You, you guys are probably tired of uh, uh, PowerPoint slides or starting to get there anyway. So the good news is uh, this is a relatively short presentation here, right? Um, not a lot of slides to it, so we'll have plenty of time for Q&A afterwards. So uh, let's go ahead and dig in. You've seen this slide before. I'm not going to spend any time on the disclaimer. But here's what we're going to cover, right? So first of all, we're going to kind of set the tone, understanding that vCenter Server has become a business critical or mission critical application in and of itself. I'm going to highlight just a little bit the effects of, of vCenter Server downtime. Again, I think probably most of us are, are, are familiar with what could potentially happen or may has, ac has actually happened uh, in your environment. Just out of curiosity, a couple quick uh, polls, if you don't mind. Uh, first of all, in the past, uh, let's say, six months, has anybody experienced any significant vCenter server downtime? So we've had a few folks with that, right? Yep. Can be uh, somewhat painful. The good news is, right, is that virtual machines continue to run without vCenter, uh, but we certainly lose some of that management capability. I guess the other question I wanted to ask, too, is uh, how many folks are running uh, vCenter in a virtual machine this day and age? Impressive. Okay. So there's been quite a swing, right? So as I mentioned, I've been with VMware for a while now, and before that, worked with VMware products as well. And uh, when, when you would ask that question, say, even three years ago, let alone five or six years ago, uh, there were very, very few hands. Most folks were running vCenter in a physical box. And, and the initial perception there was, was, well, because we need to ensure uptime, right? We're not sure about this whole virtualization thing. And, and what you've just shown me is that I think we're a little more sure of this virtualization thing now, right? So we are running our mission critical applications, including vCenter inside of a VM. So uh, we still need to think about options to protect that, right? And that's what we're going to look at today as part of this presentation is what are some of the options that I have out there? What are the pros and cons of those? Where does it come into play? For example, can I use it if my vCenter is physical or, or does it make sense if it's virtual? Those types of things. And then last but not least, I, I've got a few recommendations out there. They're, they're general recommendations because I don't know each and every one of your environments, but uh, hopefully some of these things will resonate to help you make the right decision for your particular environment. So universal hub for management. No secret, right? Um, you know, vCenter has become very important, especially as we virtualize those tier one mission critical workloads, because without vCenter, we don't have the ability to scale our virtual environment, right? Heaven forbid we would still have to manage each host individually if we have 20, 40, 200, 500, maybe 2,000 hosts out there. And there are folks with those kinds of numbers out there. So vCenter is absolutely critical to any virtualized environment if you've got more than a couple of hosts, right? No question about that. Visibility into the environment as well. Again, you guys all use vCenter, I'm sure. So you understand that it's great to be able to see things such as what is going on from a performance standpoint, right? How's the health of my cluster looking at this point in time? Where is this particular virtual machine? On which host is it running since I've got DRS moving things around without having to keep an eye on it? Those types of things are all very important for the virtual infrastructure administrator to understand. And of course, all of those come out of vCenter. What about dependencies? So if you think about all the various products that VMware has out there for different use cases, right? And there's a good handful of them listed up there on the screen. Believe it or not, each and every one of these components up here have a direct dependency on vCenter. So if you're running any one of these items here and vCenter goes down, that's going to be a big problem. Let's look at the forest extreme, right? Site recovery manager there at the top. We could be protecting literally hundreds of workloads with SRM, but if our vCenter server at our disaster recovery site is not highly available, 
And guess what? SRM is not going to work for you, right? So those are one of the, you know, one of the, the many examples that I could list here, too. View is another one. So existing view users will maintain their connections out there, but what happens when a new user comes in the environment, right? Without vCenter, we're going we're to see some issues. Capacity management, chargeback, all of those things tie into vCenter. So it needs to be there all the time. So here are some options that, uh, that I've, I've talked about with various customers through, through my travels and whatnot. Um, these are the ones we're going to take a look at. I, I'm not uh, saying that this is the all-inclusive list. There may be other ideas for protecting vCenter out there. And if your way of protecting vCenter is not on this list, I would absolutely be interested in hearing from you, uh, either at some point, maybe a quick summary during the, the discussion here, or maybe right afterwards, right at the back of the room or out in the hallway. Uh, but I think you'll find that, that most of you in the audience there probably fall under one of these buckets here, uh, traditional backup and recovery, right? Also maintaining a cold standby. This has been a popular option for, for quite a while. You'll even find it in the VMware documentation, right? So, um, some brief discussion anyway on, on maintaining a cold standby server. There are certainly clustering solutions out there. A few of the obvious ones, obviously, from Veritas. Microsoft is another popular option. We'll talk about that. And then, of course, as you saw from the show of hands, a lot of folks are running vCenter inside of a virtual machine, so VMware HA comes into play. And we also have the AppAware API solutions, too, out there from Symantec and NeverFail, which are interesting options for keeping vCenter up and running. Last but not least, we'll talk about vCenter Heartbeat. That is a VMware product in and of itself right there. It's based on NeverFail technology as well, and it's, it's a, a very intriguing solution there and perhaps one of the better ones out there. Again, we'll, we'll look at the pros and cons of all these. So when I talk about vCenter availability, I sometimes get this question. Well, you guys have linked mode, right? Doesn't that, isn't that like AD? Doesn't that federate everything? And the answer to that is absolutely it does not. It does replicate a little bit of information, such as roles, permissions, licensing information, that sort of thing. But as you can see from the screenshot, if that particular vCenter is down, you're not going to be able to get much out of the hosts that are being managed by that particular vCenter, right? It's going to show up as disconnected even in linked mode. Uh, so if there are any questions around whether linked mode is a good way of, of providing availability to vCenter, the answer is it is not. It is not designed to do that, nor can it be used to provide uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an availability level to uh, <coughs> excuse me, vCenter. So before we dig into the various options, let's talk about some basic design principles, right? This may be 101 stuff to some of you folks, but um, again, things to think about. So when we talk about RTO, recovery time objective, right? How long can I go without vCenter, right? So maybe it's okay if my vCenter server is down for four hours, meaning I can have an RTO of four hours for that particular machine. Or maybe it's five minutes, right? Again, I talked about desktops being a, a particular use case there where, where you know, very little downtime is acceptable. The other one, of course, is RPO, recovery point objective. How much information can I afford to lose? Maybe your sole view into the performance of your virtual infrastructure is through vCenter. Can you afford a two- or three-day gap in that, in that information if vCenter is down that long? Because that's exactly what those performance logs are going to look like. You're going to see a huge gap in there if vCenter is down for a few days, right? Maybe you need that information. Also think about dependencies. vCenter is not all-inclusive in and of itself. It has dependencies on DNS. I'm sure you've run into issues in the past uh, with, with any VMware environment if your DNS uh, configuration is not exactly as it should be, right? And, and that's a best practice across the board. It's been that way for many years and, and will probably continue to be that way. DNS is, is absolutely a critical part of a virtual infrastructure, so make sure that uh, you have DNS set up to work, long name, short name, uh, both forward and reverse lookup, right? Make sure all of that is working as it should. That will certainly make your virtual infrastructure work smoother. Active Directory is also a key component. Authentication, right? So make sure that that is redundant as well. Thank goodness Microsoft includes lots of redundancy into Active Directory, so we don't have to worry about that too much. Last but certainly not least, the database. So we could have all the availability in the world for vCenter, the application vCenter, but if the database that it depends on is not highly available, then that is, our, that is our weakest link in the chain, right? So we've got to make sure that all of the components, not just the vCenter application server itself, are well protected when we're thinking about making this application or service highly available. Last but not least, two on the slide here, connectivity, right? We do a great job of this with our hosts. So we'll have multiple connections off to, you know, separate switches all the way down to the core and so forth, making sure that we have redundancy across the board there. 
What about your vCenter server? Do you have multiple NICs in that? Do they go to separate switches, right? Simple things like that are what you have to think about when you're really totally looking at the big picture as far as availability around vCenter is concerned. So let's dig into some of the scenarios we may utilize. What I've done here with each one of these scenarios is, is not just speculate on using this, but I've actually gone through the, the work, if you will, of setting this up in a lab environment. I have a small lab environment that, I, that I'm lucky enough to, to work with here at VMware. I've actually gone through the process in each one of these scenarios of, of setting up redundancy using that particular um, uh, product, if you will, or, or type of product, and then going through getting rid of vCenter and then restoring that vCenter server, right? So, so I've been there and done that. Um, each one of these slides here may show a particular solution. Uh, it would be impossible to cover every solution, right? So this might be an example of a solution from that set of solutions. Make sense? So in other words, in this case, I'm talking about backup and recovery. Uh, there are tons of backup and recovery tools out there. I simply used uh, VMware Data Recovery, which is a pretty cool little product in and of itself. It's included with uh, all versions of vSphere, in case you didn't know that, except for essentials. So if you need a uh, small backup appliance, something that'll back up a few hundred VMs or 50 VMs or maybe 500 even, uh, you can use uh, this particular tool, which again is included with vSphere. Yes, sir? Yeah. Yeah, so you're correct there, right? That's per appliance. So the question was, how do you scale to 500? And I certainly don't want to get into a, a data recovery deep dive, but to quickly answer that question, you can deploy multiple VDR appliances to a single vCenter server. That's how you scale that. There's actually a session that, uh, and ironic, uh, I'll do a quick plug here. I have a session coming up uh, right after this one uh, that is a deep dive on VDR. So if you want uh, more information on that, that's one to check out. So anyway, back to the task at hand here. Uh, you can certainly back up and restore vCenter, but keep in mind you need to make sure that you have all of the components, right? It doesn't do you any good just to back up just the application server. You obviously have to have the, uh, the database and any other dependencies out there as well. In this particular case, the good news with VMware Data Recovery is uh, my, my virtual center server is, is a VM, and this particular product did not require vCenter to restore that, right? That's something else you need to think about is the backup solution you, you use if your vCenter server is virtual, does that backup solution require connectivity to vCenter? We get a chicken and the egg thing going on there, right? If vCenter is not available, but that backup and restore solution needs vCenter, then guess what? Your backup and restore solution is not going to do a very good job of protecting vCenter itself. So make sure you check little details like that. Most of them out there have workarounds, are able to connect to both the host and vCenter, but again, something to check, right? So pros and cons about that, and, and they're a little bit conflicting in, in the complexity area, but I'll explain that shortly there as you're reading down through these bullet points. The, the pros around this, of course, is it's fairly easy to implement. Chances are you've already got an existing backup solution in the environment there. Why not just add vCenter to that, right? Pretty easy to do, fairly simple to do, so that's why I mean low complexity. Uh, do not mistake that for no complexity. That's not the case. There's a few things which I'll mention toward the bottom of the slide here. Um, in most cases, you'll need minimal or no additional licensing. So depending on how your backup solution is, is licensed, you may or may not need to buy any additional components to start backing that server up as well. And uh, I don't know if anyone has looked at the vCenter server appliance, so the Linux-based appliance that we released with the, uh, v vSphere 5. Um, you can certainly protect that as well, right, especially if you do image-level backups or your, or your solution can do uh, image-level backups, I should say. Now, some of the cons around this, right? This is primarily a DR solution, okay? And let me, let me preface that a little bit. There is a difference between high availability and disaster recovery, right? I don't think we need to go over that here, but keep in mind, it's going to take longer to restore vCenter if you're just doing backup and restore, right? This is not something like that'll, that'll instantaneously fail over within a couple minutes or whatever the case might be. Certainly the restore will be quicker and easier if it's a virtual machine. So again, for all the folks that raise their hand out there, you're in a better place if, if vCenter is virtual. Um, and, and something else to keep in mind too is it's not gonna help with planned downtime, right? We, we talk about uptime for a service or an application. Most people think, right, when we have an unexpected failure. But what about those times we need to do patching, right? Or maybe there's an operating system uh, uh, service pack that comes out. Those types of things there uh, need to be figured into that availability equation too. Uh, so keep in mind that, that the backup and restore is not going to help in that space. Now, I did mention too that there is some complexity because, again, of the components that are out there. The good news is VMware has a knowledge base article 
that covers some of those things that you need to think about when you're backing up vCenter, right? We talk about the database. There's also a folder that contains SSL certificates out there. You're going to want to make sure that your backup solution grabs that and a few other odds and ends, again, which are detailed in that KB article. You don't necessarily have to write that down if you're out there. Uh, these slides will be made available at some point in the future after VMworld, probably a few weeks. So what about that cold standby server, right? And this can come in a variety of flavors. There are many ways to, to do a, a cold standby server. Um, you, you could use some sort of X copy, right? You could do something like that. Uh, if, you're, if your VM is a, a, or I'm sorry, vCenter is a virtual machine, you could simply make clones. You could use VMware Converter. There are other tools out there, such as Plate Spin. In this particular case, I, uh, I used uh, Veeam, which, which is a favorite of mine as well. They have a pretty cool backup and replication solution out there. Uh, so I, I tested this, and it, it actually worked rather well. I was, I was pretty darn impressed with, uh, with how easy it was to implement this solution and then turn around and start replicating my vCenter server from one place to the other. Uh, so that worked out pretty well. Now, some of the pros and cons about, are around that, right? Again, much easier if vCenter is a VM. And, and the, the other piece of that equation, too, is if the database is local. That is a question I, I get asked from time to time is, where should I put the vCenter server database? Should it be separate in a highly available cluster somewhere? Should it have its own VM somewhere? Or should it be on the same VM as, as vCenter? And, and there's no definitive answer to that. Um, my advice would be it, it's certainly easier if you have the database on the same server as vCenter. But on the flip side of that coin, you've got to make sure that you size that virtual machine properly, right? So there are prereqs out there for SQL Server, for example. Uh, there are prereqs for, for vCenter itself, right? Add those together. Make sure you have enough virtual CPUs, minimum of two, right? Make sure you have enough RAM out there as well for both of those applications, right? It'd probably be four or maybe six gig even, depending again on how big your environment is. Maybe more. Maybe more, right? Um, recovery time is certainly shorter than a backup and restore. Again, with that Veeam solution that I used there, uh, I was actually able to get a vCenter server. And, and keep in mind, I had the database local to vCenter. Uh, I was able to bring that back online in a matter of minutes. It happened very quickly. So, uh, so recovery time is going to be a little bit quicker, although re re recovery uh, point can vary depending on, on how often you replicate that. So if you're copying just once a week, right, obviously your RPO is going to be seven days. Or if it's a continuous replication, maybe even synchronous, then RPO could be zero. So just keep that in mind. <coughs> Excuse me. There is good flexibility with this type of solution as well. Maybe your, your design calls for just simple replication or copy to another uh, you know, host within the, the local data center or to a remote site. And the good news is, is with this type of solution, you can do either or both even, perhaps. So we've got some good flexibility there. And again, the vCenter server appliance could potentially be protected with, with this type of solution. So some of the cons, right? Now, when we're replicating, in many cases, we may not get app-level consistency. Think about the database that vCenter depends on. Uh, you may not get the, the level of quiescing, for example, that you would need, right? I do know for a fact that Veeam has some level of VSS quiescing in there. Um, I wasn't able to fully test to what level that quiescing took place. That's probably a better question for them. But again, my point there being something you should keep in mind for, for true application consistency, you may have to shut vCenter down and the database to get a truly application consistent uh, copy of, of that particular uh, vCenter server. It is a, a manual process, so if you're wanting to automate some of this, that could be a challenge, right? So in other words, to recover vCenter, chances are uh, you're going to have to have somebody in-house there that, that knows the process, right? So think about disaster recovery, for example. Uh, the, the people that know how this process works may or may not be available, depending on the severity of the disaster there. So there is some manual steps involved. Certainly more difficult uh, if vCenter is physical. I don't have a good answer around that one. Again, one more reason to, to run it inside of a VM. And, and also understand, too, that, that you're going to need a DR plan, right? When we're talking about replication here, that's more of an availability type of solution, so quick recovery. But guess what? If I've got a corrupt database at my primary site or my primary host or whatever that is, and I'm replicating to another host or another site and it's corrupt, right? Guess what I'm going to have at that second site? A corrupt database. So you're still going to need to do backup and recovery as well, just in case there is issues with the data. Clustering. What a nightmare. This ate up 80% of my time to build this presentation right here, just getting Microsoft clustering to, to even work, period, let alone actually work right, which I never was able to do with vCenter. 
Um, my, my completely uh, honest advice here is don't even try this. It's a pain in the tail. There were multiple error messages involved with this. Um, it, it's not supported. VMware is not going to help you because you have to make custom modifications to, to vCenter in order to really even half make this work. And again, as you can see from some of the screenshots up there, uh, I was getting all kinds of, of warnings around licensing and, and permissions and, and just, again, avoid it, right? So I, I think this is a pretty short conversation there. You can see the pros list is, is pretty darn short and the cons list is a little bit longer there, right? Uh, the good news is, is clustering does give us various levels of, of protection from the hardware all the way up to the application. I was able eventually to successfully recover from a variety of failures using a clustering solution. So vCenter was, was up, it was running, it failed over like it should, it was on crutches doing it, but it did eventually fail over. But like I said, it was a total headache to get it working. There is some flexibility there though, because if you do have a physical vCenter server and you're thinking, well, what if, what, you know, I need at least something to provide some availability here. Um, good news is you can cluster it with another physical or a virtual machine, right? But again, um, I, I don't recommend this solution. Cons, I think I already touched on this. There are some limitations around that as well. It's very complex. There's additional licensing that's involved. Right? because you need the enterprise version of Windows. So keep that in mind as well. It could be a little more costly. And again, just like the previous solution, this is an availability solution. This is not a disaster recovery solution. So do I need to still back up vCenter? Absolutely, absolutely. Some interesting technologies here, right? So I think everybody is familiar with VMware HA. Uh, with, with vSphere 4, we, we introduced APIs to go along with, uh, I think it was 4.1 actually, I, I'd have to go back and check my notes on that. But either way, we introduced the, the APIs to go along with, uh, with VMware HA. And, and we had two, um, in, two vendors that we worked with closely. Uh, one was Symantec, the other was uh, uh, NeverFail. Uh, Symantec's version is called Application HA. And uh, I think NeverFails is VApp HA. I always get those confused, but that's, that's pretty close, I think. Uh, I believe both of those folks are also in the solutions exchange area. So if you have more questions around these two particular products, I encourage you to check them out because what it does is it allows us to integrate application protection with the existing VMware HA protection, right? So with VMware HA by itself, we have protection against losing a host, right? Our vCenter VM will get rebooted on another host within the cluster, uh, and, and that's, that's an important point to note out, right? So, so some folks have asked me, will VMware HA work if vCenter goes down? And the answer to that is yes. With versions of HA prior, to vSphere 5, it would work one time, okay? So HA would work, it would, it would survive one failover, but at that point you would need vCenter to come back online to do some reconfiguration there, right? Uh, with vSphere 5, we've improved HA, uh, we can survive multiple failures now without vCenter in the mix, so uh, much improved. But uh, anyway, that's kind of a footnote. What I wanna get to is, is we can protect from that downtime there, we can also protect against OS failure. So for example, a Windows blue screen, uh, HA has the ability to see that and reboot that virtual machine in case that happens, right? What we're missing, or what VMware was missing from that stack, was the ability to protect the application. So what if the application service, for example, crashed, right? Or what if there was a performance issue or something along that line? HA, as it stood in VMware stack, had no way of knowing that, so therefore we couldn't protect against those types of failures, if you will. Uh, with these solutions here, we now have the ability to monitor services inside of those virtual machines. There's an agent, for example, that gets installed with application HA, and you tell it to monitor specific services. What will happen then is that agent will restart that service, and then you can also set it to a point where, okay, if, it, if that doesn't work, then we can go ahead and reboot that virtual machine as well. So now we have protection all the way up and down the stack with, uh, with HA there. It was pretty easy to deploy, a couple screenshots there. As you can see, I'm protecting a couple of services there. These are actually slightly dated. Um, I'm protecting vCenter 4.1 in, in this particular screenshot uh, with application HA 5.1. But again, if uh, you want details on, on vSphere 5 uh, support, I encourage you to stop by the Symantec booth and ask them about that. Yes, sir. You know, that's, again, that's probably a better question for them. Based on the, the amount of work that I did, they were just looking at the cluster, at the, I'm sorry, not the cluster, the service, right? So in other words, whether it was stopped or started, right, on or off. 
Uh, there were a few additional things that you could uh, specify in there, such as the availability of, of the system drive, for example. So if there was a dependency on a certain drive, maybe you have vCenter installed on, a, let's say, a D drive, right? And if that D drive is not available, that agent that's running on the C drive would understand that and also issue warnings up through the system. So there were a couple checks and balances in there, but again, not a completely um, all-inclusive solution there. Again, for more details, I, I, would, I would approach the vendor there in Solutions Exchange, but still very cool, very cool. So pros and cons around this, right? Again, I mentioned it was pretty darn easy to set this up. Uh, kudos to those guys for the way they implemented this technology. Uh, here, here's the key thing, right? So with, with what we've talked about so far to this point, most of it has been manual steps, right? Uh, obviously, the clustering solutions, whether it's a Microsoft or a Veritas type of solution, that there's some automation there. Uh, and, and that continues in, into this space. So we can get some automated recovery based on uh, you know, it, pretty much any type of failure, whether it's a host failure, a VM uh, guest OS failure, or perhaps even the, the application itself, right? vCenter itself, it, it, it automatically heals itself. So that's a good thing. It complements VMware HA. You already have that, right? So this, this solution just plugs right in there, which is really nice. And, and here's, the, here's the key thing, too. So we talked about clustering just a few moments ago, obviously requiring a couple of nodes. Uh, this particular implementation, like Symantec, for example, is, is kind of a, a modified Veritas cluster, a single node, if you will. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what they have running underneath the covers there. Uh, so we don't have to consume as many resources, right? We don't need two virtual machines in a, in a cluster type of configuration. So uh, if, if resources are scarce in your environment, uh, every, every piece of, uh, of RAM and CPU counts, then, then this might be an interesting option to look at. Now, some of the cons out there, right, is obviously these, these products will cost money. Um, as a footnote to that, with vSphere 5, we have opened up these APIs. So there's an SDK out there now that you can actually write to this particular API. So if you have another application, uh, or you know developers that are writing applications in-house and want to utilize those APIs, good news is, with, again, with vSphere 5, uh, you can utilize these as well. But anyway, back to the subject at hand, which is vCenter. Um, it, one of the, either one of these box solutions, of course, will have a licensing cost. And, and, and what happens if you have issues? Who do you call, right? Do I call Neverfail or Symantec, or is it a VMware issue? Or, and then we get some of this going on, right? So, I, you know, most of the time the support organizations work okay together. Uh, they, obviously, we want to keep the customers happy, but you still may run into an issue where you have to call both and, and kind of you know, bridge that, that discussion there a little bit. Um, no, no protection against network failures, right, from a, from a uh, VM standpoint. So in other words, the, the Symantec application didn't understand that, so it didn't fail because it was monitoring a service, not the network. So there were some challenges there. And of course, if, uh, if vCenter is on a physical box, um, this product's not going to work, right? It's designed to work in the VMware HA, a virtualized environment. And you still need a DR plan. The other thing to point out, too, is with a solution like this is, again, when we talk about uptime, that includes both planned and unplanned downtime. That's great for unplanned downtime, but what about when we need to do patching? Just like I mentioned before, that's still going to, uh, to mean an outage to your vCenter server with this type of solution because there's only one node. This brings me to the last one here, and, and you know, it's, it's pretty obvious. I mentioned that I work for VMware, so, so I'm, I'm probably slightly biased here, but I truly believe this is the best option for vCenter availability. Maybe not the cheapest or the easiest, but if you want um, the, probably the best way to protect vCenter, Heartbeat is going to be the ticket here, without question. Uh, it's purely software-based, so you install Heartbeat on two nodes. You have a primary node and a secondary node. There is really nothing shared between those two, so you can afford the loss of either node without affecting the other, okay? Uh, it's an active-passive type of setup, so there's no load balancing that takes place here. And there is application awareness on many levels, right? So Heartbeat really understands all the components of vCenter inside and out. Obviously, this is devel developed by VMware, so we know, you know vCenter best, I would think. And uh, also never fail underneath the covers there, too. Those guys have been around for a while, so we kind of took the best of both worlds and combined those together to build this product here. It also offers protection against both hardware and software failures. So it doesn't matter if you're running vCenter in a physical box or a virtual machine, or maybe with Heartbeat, it's a combination. Maybe your primary vCenter server is physical. You could easily run a secondary node as a virtual machine as well. So a pretty flexible solution here. It has a, a, a variety of things that it protects against. So hardware failures is an obvious one. If we, if we lose the hardware that supports that, whether it's, a, whether it's a, an ESXi host or an actual physical box, right, that we have vCenter running on, 
Uh, it will be able to protect against those types of failures there through, through a heart beating mechanism and also with OS failures too. So if we get a blue screen or some other type of a hang up, it'll understand that. It also monitors networking. So there are heartbeats that go back and forth. It will know when vCenter is offline from a networking perspective as well. It actually goes and pings various points in your network. I think you can specify three different areas, uh, such as like, I think it's your um, global catalog server in Active Directory. I think the, the other one is the default gateway, and I can't think of the third one offhand, but it's all documented, of course, in the documentation there for Heartbeat. Application failures, so service, right? If the service fails, we can restart that or fail over to that secondary node. And perhaps the most intriguing thing with Heartbeat that you don't find in any other of, of these solutions that I've talked about up to this point is performance, right? So if, if you have vCenter performing poorly, in other words, it's taking multiple minutes to log into vCenter or to, to perform any type of action in there, for all intents and purposes, that vCenter server is down, right? Even though it appears to be online, the service is running, right? Windows is up and running, the machine's on. Uh, if we can't use it, it's down. Uh, what's nice about Heartbeat is we can understand if there's a degradation in performance there as well. So we can set thresholds inside of, uh, of Heartbeat. For example, if CPU spikes above 80% for, let's say, a, a period of five minutes straight, Heartbeat will understand that as well and be able to fail over to that second node to hopefully fix that issue. Here's a few screenshots there. So we have, uh, we have protection against both planned and unplanned downtime. For example, if we need to do maintenance on the primary, uh, on the primary vCenter uh, node, if you will, uh, add memory, firmware update, OS patch, whatever the case might be, we can perform what is called a switchover, which will gracefully change the, uh, the, the activity between the primary and the secondary, so that makes that secondary active. Now the question is, is there downtime to vCenter as part of this? Yes. You will experience a couple, maybe three or four minutes uh, in, of time there. We, we will not be able to access vCenter while it does the switchover, right? But again, it's measured in just a few minutes. It's not, uh, it's not many minutes or hours, right? Uh, we can also do failover, unplanned downtime. So heartbeat will, after a certain time, right? Once it, it doesn't get so many heartbeats or, or it, no network connectivity after so many seconds, uh, it will see that and also fail over the node in that particular case there. There's also a screenshot, and my apologies to the folks in the back if you're not able to see it there, uh, but I talked about performance monitoring. So again, we can set thresholds. For example, I think this one shows uh, processor usage uh, above 70% for a duration of 600 seconds, right? So for 10 minutes, uh, if we've got a thread that's just run away and spiked that CPU in there, heartbeat's going to go, wait a minute, we've got a problem here. Go ahead and, and perform whatever action we decide on. So you can actually say on the first failure, uh, log it, right? On the second failure, uh, maybe go ahead and, and restart the application. And perhaps the third failure is, is you know, fail over to the other node. So pros and cons here, um, quite the opposite of the Microsoft clustering one. We have a lot more in the pros column than the cons here. Again, I, I wanted to, to try to take an a, a unbiased approach to all these, but, but as you can see, Heartbeat does a great job of, of, of protecting against many different things, right? All the way from the hardware to, to performance level of the application uh, and everything in between. It has awareness of a lot of the vCenter components out there as well. So does Heartbeat protect just vCenter? Uh, the answer to that is it protects vCenter, but it also protects some of the other things, such as Update Manager, for example. You can even use that to protect the database as well, if it's a SQL server, whether it's local or even on another machine. So you've got some options for protecting dependencies, too. We talked about those dependencies earlier. Okay? The other key piece, too, and, and this is probably the deal breaker, right? It's the only solution that is fully supported by VMware. We're not going to help you troubleshoot a clustering, a Microsoft clustering issue. We're not going to hang up on you, but at the same time, there's a certain level of support we give when, when it comes to using a third-party solution, right, to protect vCenter. If you want true, through and through, full support from top to bottom, uh, heartbeat with vCenter is, is the ticket here from a supportability standpoint. As I mentioned before, uh, it can protect the database, whether it's local or, or remote. Uh, View Composer can also be protected now. This is a recent addition here over the past few months that we've added. And uh, you also have some flexibility, too, as where you deploy that second node. Uh, in most cases, I see it deployed in a LAN type of configuration, so, so both nodes in the same data center. But if, if your particular requirements call for that secondary node to be at a remote site, uh, you can certainly configure uh, Heartbeat in a WAN type of scenario as well. Okay? Now, some of the cons there, again, additional licensing costs. Heartbeat is not the cheapest thing we have on the menu. I'm not going to lie to you. 
All right, so there's a cost, but in most cases, you get what you pay for. So if you're looking for true availability for vCenter, this is well worth the investment here. And the other thing, again, this is, a, this is an availability type of solution. This is not a replacement for backup and recovery. You're still going to need to backup vCenter and its database, so keep that in mind. So down to the, oh, I'm sorry, question here, yes. It is licensed from VMware. You purchase the license and support from VMware for Heartbeat. Yes, sir, right in front. Uh, four is supported as well. Five and four both, yes. So let, let's summarize here just a little bit, okay? Uh, vCenter is mission critical. I think that's no secret, so let's treat it like that. Develop the RTO and RPO and, and plan and map your solution accordingly. Test it, right? This is no different than any other availability or disaster recovery solution. Let's, let's get it set up in the lab first. Make sure you test it thoroughly. Let's make sure that happens. And, and as far as a recommendation, I think you need a combination, right? I, I've mentioned this many times throughout the presentation here. HA is not a replacement for DR and vice versa. You need both. So maybe your environment might look something like this, right? Maybe we've got, uh, we've got an HA DRS cluster there with heartbeat protecting two virtual machines that make up the primary and secondary node. We have an affinity rule on DRS to make sure that those virtual machines are always on separate hosts. We also make sure that our database is well protected, whether it's locally installed or maybe it's in a highly available database cluster somewhere, right? Uh, whatever makes sense there for your organization, but you gotta make sure those dependencies are protected. But then in addition to Heartbeat and all those things we have set up in the VMware cluster, we're gonna do backups as well. And we're going to test restores, right? Anybody can back up. It's the pros that can actually restore. So make sure you do test restores as well. Question right here real quick. Yes, sir. So, so vCenter just looks for the database, right? So however you have that designed in there, that it, it's not going to matter. You, you understand what I'm saying? So in other words, there's no like, hard dependency on the exact location of that database. So if you've got mirroring going on and you've got the, the mechanisms uh, set up around that so that vCenter knows to go over here instead of over here through DNS, for example, then it, it, will, it will utilize that, right? Yeah. No, it does not. That's all done at the database level. Yes, sir. Question here. Yes. So the question was, when you have heartbeat and you're doing a failover from the primary to the secondary node, does it update DNS accordingly? And the answer to that is yes, it does. Good question. Any other questions out there? Uh, in the middle, please. <laughs> No, it's currently uh, two nodes only. Uh, one second, I saw a hand back here previously. Hang tight. Yes, sir. Uh, it's Windows only. So Heartbeat is a Windows only type of solution right now. If you're going to use the vCenter uh, appliance, which is a Linux-based appliance, Heartbeat's not going to help you. Question here. Yep. Right. You know, that's, that's, a, uh, that's a huge debate, right? And the question there was, if you have vCenter running as a virtual machine, should it be on a, a standard switch or a distributed switch? Um, I'm a little bit from the old school, right? Because I've been doing this a little while, so I'm still kind of thinking standard switch, but there are folks out there that, that would argue with me all night that you can absolutely do distributed switches all day long. And especially with you know, improvements we continue to make in that stack there, that's something you really just need to test thoroughly, depending on what version of vSphere and whatnot you're on. It has burnt you a little bit, so yeah. Word of caution there, right? But again, the results mileage is gonna vary just a little bit. I have a question uh, right here. Gentleman actually got up for the microphone, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, two, two things. Um, one drawback con on both the HA and the clustering would be you're probably still dependent on shared storage. Yes. And for the cold standby server solution, another solution that I've used several sites is SQL log shipping. Yes. And that would allow you to do it with the physical server as well. 
Yeah, good point. So there's uh, a good tidbit for consideration as you design yours, right? If you, are, you do not have the luxury of shared storage, then HA is not going to help you out much there, right? So again, you have to think about uh, what you have at, at your availability and, of course, what your RTO and RPO targets are for that vCenter box as to what solution you're going to use for that. Fairly short conversation, like I mentioned. That's good, though, right? Give you a little time back. Any other questions uh, out there? One right here. Go ahead. So the question is, can I use FT to protect vCenter server? If you look at the minimum requirements for a, v, a supported vCenter server, it requires two CPUs. Uh, VMware fault tolerance only supports one CPU at this point, so I wish it did, but we're not there yet. Um, stay tuned. We're working on that. Over here, sir. What's that? Oh, over here? I beg your pardon. Yes, sir. Up front here. Go ahead. What's the plan for the appliance? That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure on that yet. Justin? Here, come on over here a second. Let me get you a microphone. Sorry, I don't to put you on the spot, brother. So obviously the appliance is, is uh, virtual, and uh, just like we're virtualizing tier one applications, uh, the recommended approach right now for the appliance is vSphere HA. Uh, it does use two CPUs, so FT is not an option at that point. Okay. Thank you. I'm not sure where you heard that, because that is not true. There was a live demo we had a live demo, but it's not currently uh, supported in vSphere 5, right? So like I said, we're working on it. We're working on it. Uh, right up here. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just curious, uh, did you consider, uh, and I have a parochial interest, so I work for a company that makes a fault-tolerant server, did you consider just running vCenter server on a fault-tolerant platform? No, and, and as I prefaced beforehand, right, so you're from Stratus Technologies, yep. So you've got a fault-tolerant solution that might be a good candidate for vCenter availability. We have a, a hardware-based fault-tolerant platform. Okay. So it will ride through any component failure. So you guys may want to talk to Stratus. Again, as I, as I mentioned early in the discussion, I, I didn't have the capacity or time to, to fully test every single type of solution out there, right? There's, there's tons of them. Uh, just do your homework there. Question over here, yes. Uh -huh. Um, Justin, database in the appliance, DB2, isn't it? DB2, yeah. So, uh, for just like uh, the installable vCenter, we have SQL Express. The appliance has DB2 Express. That's what I thought. And it's limited. To, you know, it's not a hard limit. It's a pri uh, sizing performance issue. But it's a uh, five host, 50 VMs type of max supported configuration. But, yeah. Very good. I thought so, but 100%. Any other questions? We've got a few folks here at the so microphone. Go ahead. You talked about uh, having two nodes in the cluster right now. Uh, is there any plan to uh, provision for cascaded failover, uh, local site, and then possibly uh, a DR site kind of a uh, scenario? Yeah, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I haven't heard anything along that line there, which, which is, again, why I recommend a, a combination, right? right? Maybe heartbeat for HA and then turn around and do backup and recovery to that DR site. Uh, this just might be a repeat of what he just said, but if I have two locations, I, this does not work across two separate locations, right, because of the SQL Server aspect? Ah. Uh. Go ahead. So if you have, you know, one location A and location B and you want to have the high availability across those two, your SQL database is at one location, so you'd have to do some sort of log shipping or something in order to be able to get that? You could potentially do that, or Heartbeat can also protect a SQL database instance, specifically, not Oracle, just SQL Server, but you could do that in any way and configuration as well. Okay, so you could then have two separate locations with that, with Correct. SQL uh, databases at both sides? Yes. Okay. So the question is, how do I protect the vCenter appliance across two locations? And you're going to have to look at one of those other options that I mentioned there, right? So maybe some type of replication or a, a backup to your DR site, something along that line, right? There's not a good, solid solution out there around that appliance quite yet. Uh, it's brand new, uh, but certainly things we're considering. It's Linux, I know. It should, it should be easy. <laughs> I know, I know. We've got some work to do there, but you're right. 
So the question is around VDR, what is the traditional user interface, right? And, and technically the user interface when you use that tool is the vSphere client, not vCenter itself, right? You can use VDR to do backups and restores through vCenter, but it's not required to do restores. So you can connect directly to a vSphere host and restore your vCenter server VM using VDR that way. Hand over here. I, I'm sorry, sir, I couldn't hear you. What was that again? Uh, are, there, are there any, the question was, are there any uh, best practices for these certificates? And, and that's outlined in that knowledge base article that I mentioned there. Pretty much just need to make sure you have a copy of them. And. Oh, very good question. Is, are there any issues with running uh, Heartbeat and Site Recovery Manager together? The answer to that is SRM is just looking for vCenter as an instance, right? Doesn't matter what the un underlying infrastructure of that vCenter uh, configuration looks like. So the answer is yes, it will work that way. Well, so there's a couple things there, right? So when I talk about deploying vCenter, so she, she's asking about across like a WAN type of deployment with Heartbeat, correct? So in that particular case, keep in mind you're bringing up the same instance of vCenter, just at a different site. With Site Recovery Manager, you need two separate instances of vCenter, one for your primary, one for your secondary. So what that configuration might likely look like is Heartbeat de deployed in a LAN configuration locally, and then, of course, replication to your DR site, which will have another vCenter server with Heartbeat protecting it in a LAN type of configuration. Okay? Yes, sir. And hang tight right there. I'll, uh, you're, you're right next. Go ahead. Um, that's, you know, Justin, are you still close by? That is one I don't know the answer to that he might, though. Hang tight. I'll hook you guys up. All right. Go ahead over here. How about this question? So the, the common thread here is that you've got a single vCenter. It's sort of a single stack, right? You've got a traditional transactional database and a single service running somewhere. Are you guys at all looking at distributing the application, putting it on, on, on a different framework, uh, anything like that? Yeah, certainly. We're, you know, that's something we've talked about now. If, if you've been privy to roadmaps that VMware has, has allowed folks to look at, uh, something we've been talking about for a while. I, I don't know all of the details, but we are absolutely looking at that and, and, and making some decisions around that as we speak. So stay tuned on that one. Any other questions, comments? I think we're good. Guys, thanks for sticking around. Have a great afternoon.